So it is with great pleasure that I have the privilege to introduce our Lieutenant Governor, Meet Treadwell. And uh, every time that he comes and makes the time to present uh, at one of our entrepreneurship initiatives, I'm always encouraged by it. I think you have a wealth of information to share, as well as the fact that it, it's just so encouraging to me to have a leader in state government that's actually an entrepreneur and has done exciting things on their own rights and now um, leads us as a state. So thank you very much. Christy, thank you. And uh, Christy, also thank you for all you do. And uh, it's great to be here with Scott and Bear and Alan, who has been an encouragement officer for a long, long time. For those of you who haven't uh, dealt with Alan, uh, thank you all. Um, what I thought I'd do right now is just give you a little bit of personal history on some of the business ventures, the string of, uh, of ventures that I've had the privilege to be involved with. Uh, not all of them were successful. Uh, some of them are still going on. Uh, some of them have had various kind of morphs, but uh, uh, I guess I will say it's a, uh, you know, it's a little slice of my life in adventure capital, and then we'll talk a little bit about state policy on trying to help ventures, and then hopefully leave uh, uh, plenty of time for questions and, and discussion. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, uh, my feet are just warming up. We've been at the Rondi Parade this morning, so. <laughs> but uh, the dog races are off and running. Um, I was just going to tell you, I, I was a kid born in Connecticut uh, to a father who uh, worked in a couple of businesses. He happened to be part of a, a, a time in our history when we went from lead type to print newspapers to offset printing. And so our, on our ping pong table in our basement quite often would be all this kind of equipment. And if you wanted to find dad or if he was working late, he was out uh, converting a newspaper to offset. And uh, I got to know a little bit about printing, a little bit about that as, as a kid. I took a printing class in high school, and I wish vo take, uh, vocational technical education were much more of a mainstream thing in our high schools, uh, again, because even though I didn't go into printing per se, just the fact that I took that my freshman year gave me a lot of understanding of things that I've done later on. Um, my first entrepreneurial venture was, I guess, when I was in, in high school, uh, a good friend of our family had a stained glass company that made lamps and so forth and he, he dragged the three of us as slave labor into his company and uh, gave us all titles and we set up a retail store in Traverse City, Michigan and uh, um, built uh, Tiffany lamps and that was kind of fun and I have got scars on my fingers to prove it from the times we were cutting glass and so forth but that was kind of a craft business. Um, and I'll tell you I went to college and I had no idea uh, that I wanted to go to business school. I actually was uh, um, aiming to be a lawyer. Uh, I came up here after, uh, I had been up here before I'd gone to Yale and I came up here after uh, Yale and I worked for Wally Hickel as his press secretary in a race against Governor Jay Hammond, which he lost and then I got a job uh, uh, working for Bob Atwood who was the owner then of the Anchorage Times. And uh, uh, these were kind of good jobs after school and I then ran away with a circus on John Connolly's campaign for president, which was Fascinating to be on an airplane all over the country, uh, you know, doing the same thing that's happening right now through the primaries and, and, and all that. We had Josh Romney here last night, as a matter of fact. Um, and then, um, then I got out of that, and uh, Jim Brady, who was uh, later to be Ronald Reagan's press secretary, asked me to join him on the Reagan campaign. And I said, Jim, you don't understand. I want you guys to be president. I want to live in Alaska under the American flag with you guys as president because I love Alaska and I love the opportunities and I didn't, you know, if I were going to move to Washington, I could have done that a long time ago. Uh, and I came up here and I was just about to buy the Kodiak Daily Mirror and uh, when John Connolly had dropped out of the race in 1980, my grandmother and my best friend from college had called me and said, where your conscience calling, you promised yourself you were going to go to grad school. And I said, well, I got the crappiest grade on my senior thesis. Uh, nobody's going to let me into grad school. And they said, well, then, but you owe it to yourself to try. So I filled out applications to Harvard and Stanford, forgot about them. I mean, just totally didn't even think they had a, had a chance. And uh, uh, went to Kodiak to buy the newspaper and thought I'd be wearing, you know, extra tufts and, and uh, writing about fish for the rest of my life and <laughs> trying, to, trying to avoid being eaten by a big bear. Uh, and, uh, 
uh, as I was working on this thing with the mirror, one of those thin envelopes dropped into my mailbox one day, and it was from Harvard and said, uh, we've invited you to come to Harvard Business School. So I said, well, I better go check it out. I didn't even think it was possible. So I did check it out, decided that it was something I wanted to do, called the people in Kodiak and said, you can keep your two or I'll keep my $200,000, which I didn't have $200,000. That's a <laughs> different story. But uh, 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 I'll keep, uh, uh, you know, I'll let Wally Hickel and Bob Atwood and Boone Pickens keep their money, and uh, 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 we'll, we'll go to business school. And it was a fascinating time. It was a fascinating two years. And if you have a chance to go get an MBA, or if you are in the process here, I, I just recommend it. It's, it was, for me, the most fun part of school. And I didn't think I was going to go to business school because I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I ended up getting better grades on my business boards and uh, having a, I guess I wrote a good application. So I uh, got in. First thing they did is they called an assembly and they said, we want you to know we don't make mistakes. Uh, you all may think you're here as a mistake. Uh, uh, and so there's certainly people who have gone on and made gazillions of dollars. But uh, anyway, it was a very interesting time. I got out and I had two opportunities. I had an opportunity to work in venture capital in California that uh, offered me a very nice job uh, in Silicon Valley. And Governor Wally Hickel called me and said, you know, Meade, I just gave those guys in California a really good recommendation for you. But why don't you come up to Alaska and help me start a gas pipeline? And Ron Duncan, who was starting a little company called GCI at the time, said, well, you know, we've got this chance to get a cellular telephone company started in Alaska. Why don't you come up and work for me part time? So that total amount of salary I was offered in 1980 was probably about $4,000 a month, which was enough to pay rent, uh, but it sure wasn't what they were offering Harvard MBAs in Silicon Valley at the time. Uh, but I kept uh, going to California and saying, I'm not in Alaska. I want to be in Alaska. You know, there's, my mountains aren't here or anything else. So we came up and we worked on starting two ventures. The cell phone venture was one there that we laid out the first statewide uh, cellular telephone business. And the FCC changed the rules in the middle of the game. And instead of having a project that they would pick by merit, you had a lottery that you would lose by chance. And uh, a 15-year-old kid won the lottery, sold his licenses to the McCaw family who built Cellular One that later became AT&T. Uh, so that was $100,000 of other people's money down the drain. But we had fun trying to put it together. Governor Hickel and Governor Egan asked us to put together a natural gas pipeline venture, uh, which we did. And I found myself bringing together some of the top engineering firms in the world, top uh, marketing uh, companies, consulting companies in Asia, uh, major law firm here, and a major investment bank in New York. And believe it or not, that was the last time a governor had been really committed to building a natural gas pipeline across Canada, and the market had fallen away. And so we said, let's look at LNG. And so we put together the feasibility study for an LNG project. It later became a pipeline company. Uh, we uh, were at a point where we were negotiating with the big oil producers, and there's a long story here, but uh, the president of Arco said to me, you know, you're just a small, scrappy entrepreneurial bunch. If you guys were aligned with a big pipeline company, we'd have to deal with you. So about, oh, I don't know, probably six months later, I'm back in the office of the president of Arco. Uh, and I said, well, we just sold our majority interest to, uh, TS, uh, to Texas Gas, which was owned then by CSX, a big East Coast Railroad, largest gas pipeline company in America. And his answer was, oh, darn, now we really do have to deal with it. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was a very interesting venture where a group of Alaskans came together with a group of Texans. And, and uh, it's a long story there, but it was... Uh, you know, we knew who our strategic partners would be, and some of the strategic partners wanted us to get along. And during, so from 82 to 89, I helped put together this gas pipeline venture, which we were total failures. Financially, uh, for me, for, for some of the early players, we did very well because we sold the project uh, to a company that later put close to $100 million into the project. So financially, I got everything out of it and more so and did as well as I might have in Silicon Valley. But uh, we still don't have a pipeline, and I'm a little upset about that. But that at least gave me a little bit of financial independence to go look at some other projects. Uh, 1989, when I sold out of uh, Yukon Pacific, um, Exxon Valdez hit the rocks. I worked on that. We also opened the border between Alaska and Russia, started a little company called Siberia Alaska Trading Company. Believe it or not, you, know, you wonder, how can you make money out of the fact that we are 
You can see Russia from here. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, ultimately, it was groceries and tourism. Uh, we sold a lot of groceries to the Russians during a period of time. And we weren't the biggest, actually. Uh, um, Tyson Chicken, through an entrepreneur in Anchorage, Steve Zellner, sold half, half the chicken that Russia consumed uh, those early years coming out of that. And there were, there were a number of things that Alaskans, I could name five or six entrepreneurs here who did that. But we ultimately brought 5,000 tourists to, to eastern Siberia who had wanted to see the birds, the polar bears, that sort of thing. And that was a very exciting deal to put together because it was a lot of time in helicopters over there and uh, uh, so forth. About the same time the border opened, uh, Governor Steve Cooper started something called the Alaska Science and Technology Foundation. And through some personal connections of mine, I'd served on an asset advisory board. We had brought up uh, Dr. George Kosmetsky from the University of Texas here, who was one of the America's brilliant entrepreneurs. He had co-founded Teledyne. He had helped Michael, dorm, uh, Michael Dell get out of his dorm room. <laughs> and, uh, uh, after uh, I served for four years in the Hegel administration, I was named to the Science and Tech Foundation that George Kosmetsky and Ron Duncan and, and uh, Dick Strutz, the head of Wells Fargo here, and a number of others were members of the board of. And that gave us a chance to look at a lot of different deals uh, for a period of time. And at the same time, uh, a friend of mine called and said, you know, Mead, I've invented this thing called digital watermark. And I said, wow, we're going to need that. And he says, yeah, you, how, how do you know that? And I said, well, everything's going to be digital, Jeff. We're going to have digital pictures. We're going to have digital movies. We're going to have digital music. Uh, and uh, uh, he says, well, if I send you an airplane ticket, will you come down and we, uh, to, to Portland to McMenamin's Resort? I've got about 18 people that were, that were given a weekend at this resort. We're going to line the walls. It was a room this size with butcher paper. We're going to say, if this technology works, what's it good for? Uh, and so we did, and we learned about the technology, and sure enough, it was a way to invisibly put a watermark on any digital object that is a representation of something analog, so, so to speak. If you take a picture, there's noise, signal noise, if you've heard about that, if you've got engineering. If you record a sound, there's noise as well as the signal, so to speak. And what we did is we make the noise less random. That's the elevator pitch of what the technology did. And we wrote white papers about it, put it on the internet, scraped up $800,000. I had just sold our house in June, and we had $50,000 and put into it, and I earned another $50,000 in uh, uh, stock uh, working for the company. And of course, we ran out of money almost immediately. Uh, and everybody we wanted to talk to wouldn't really talk to us. Uh, but we said to ourselves, this is a technology that, you know, if we are there and there are other people trying it, is going to make a lot of difference to the movie industry, to the photo industry, to the music industry, uh, to counterfeiting and so forth. So uh, we had a combination of luck and uh, good things ha uh, happen to us. And um, uh, we had Motorola call us up and said, you know, been, we're looking for investments in this area. They gave us $900,000, they loaned it to us, later made us pay them back, and they would have, had they waited another year, they would have made something like 50 or $60 million from that, that uh, $900,000. Uh, with um, uh, with uh, uh, the products that we had, we first got into Adobe Photoshop, and we're there today. And if you use the watermarking thing in Adobe Photoshop, our watermarking software is there, and it protects your pictures. You can use that. Go out on the internet uh, and have, uh, or the internet will tell you if somebody else is using your pictures. And there's a lot of people that happens for. Uh, and uh, so, so that became the core business. I uh, kind of absented myself from the company when we ran out of money, and I went to work for one of our first customers, which works with all the publishers in the country to f fight copyright infringement. And they had a new digital division. I worked with their digital division. I think I was the only guy working out of a garage in Anchorage, Alaska on Hollywood issues, trying to protect this new thing coming along called DVDs. And uh, we knew that the company that made money in this business was called Macrovision. And Macrovision was, uh, got a nickel to a quarter for every VHS tape that was made. And I went in to see the folks at Macrovision. and then, and. Uh, they said, well, you know, we, you're right. There needs to be a digital solution. We think we have the digital solution. Uh, we'll see you later. 
And uh, that happened probably two or three meetings. And it turned out by luck that a classmate of mine from business school just had become the vice president of Macrovision. So it meant I could have a beer or a cup of coffee with him anytime we showed up at the tra same trade show together. And he kept saying, my boss is still firm that we're going to make our own technology work. So he's probably going to say no, but I'm just going to tell you it's not working. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so we went on trying to hit other ways in the digital television industry. And the first people doing digital television were the dish networks. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, you were still buying your VHS at Blockbuster when you would be receiving digital TV over digital networks. Your cable company may not have even gone to a digital set-top box. And the lucky thing happened there is I'm in a meeting with the Satellite Broadcasters Association in Washington, D.C., and Taylor Howard, who invented that little, tra the Stanford professor, who invented that little transducer that made the dish network work, was on the phone in California. And he'd had, you know, I'd, we'd faxed him my business card. They still had fax machines then. This is 96, 97. And uh, uh, he's, he says, Mead, where are you from? And I said, well, 907 is one of those West Coast area codes, sir. You didn't want to tell a guy from Silicon Valley that you were in Alaska working these issues. And he says, no, I'm on to you. 907 is Alaska. My son lives in Palmer. Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Anchorage, sir. And uh, he said, well, uh, I'm going to be up there with the grandchildren in about a week or so. And after about the third day, I'm going to really want to escape to have lunch. Can I come in and have lunch with you? And I said, sure. And we made a nice lunch from the house. And uh, uh, we're talking about digital video. And uh, he said, well, you really ought to be working with a company called Macrovision. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know. And we've been beating on their door. And he says, well, who have you been talking to? And he said, well, and I said, the CEO. He said, oh, well, he's, the, he's a nice guy, but he's the hired hand. Talk to the owner. Um, I'll give him a call. And this, the short end of the story is that about uh, six months later, Macrovision and Philips out of uh, the Netherlands made about a $70 million investment in our company. Uh, and we became the standard for digital, uh, digital television. So here we were, the standard for photography, but not making much money out of it, the standard for digital television and waiting for the uptake in DVDs. And uh, then we got a phone call, and I may have the chronology a little bit wrong, uh, from a group. We had also tried with a company called American Banknote Company, which was chartered in the time of George Washington's era. That printed most of the currency, or much of the currency, for countries around the world that didn't have their own specialized currency press, printing presses. And they said, yeah, this is a good idea. It would help fight counterfeiting. but." Uh, Nobody's asking for it, so we'll see you later. And we also wanted to be in the ID card division. And uh, I remember going to spend a week in Cambridge, Massachusetts, outside Polaroid. And I talked to a guy at Polaroid, and he said, yeah, call me when you get to Boston. We'll sit down. And he never returned my phone calls once I got to Boston. So it was a very fun. We had some other calls in, in, in the Boston area. But, but the long and the short of it is we were networking at the time of the dot-com boom, trying to, trying to find these deals. and. Uh, uh, in the case of American Banknote, they kept saying no, but we got a phone call out of Europe and it said we're a consortium of the 30 largest central banks in the world and we want to use your technology to watermark money. And now on any piece of currency that you have, our technology has probably made 11 million different changes to that piece of currency to help fight counterfeiting. And I can't tell you what they all are, but, uh, uh, <laughs> or even, even the first million are, but I mean I can tell you that there's a number of ways our technology is employed. So it's pretty exciting to have been part of a technology that's in your pocket everywhere. Uh, and uh, then the Polaroid guys, the company went public in 1999. At one point it had a market value of about a billion during the bubble. It's kind of settled down to a couple hundred million dollars. But we took some of the cash we earned in the, in the public offering and bought the ID card division of Polaroid as Polaroid went bankrupt. My first phone call to Jeff Rhodes, the inventor and on the board, is find that son of a gun who wouldn't let, take my call and fire him. Uh, but uh, we, became, uh, we, we became the, uh, the major uh, producer of ID cards, driver's licenses in the country and so forth, and ultimately sold that uh, part of the company two years later. So that's one of the ventures that, that stuck, that worked. There are several others that did or didn't work or had several different changes. Um, with Jeff Rhodes, who was the inventor of digital watermarking, we started a company called Venture at Astra, which has done several other entrepreneurial things, things you may have heard about. 
We invested in a company called Immersive Media, which I chaired as it went public on the Canadian Stock Exchange. And uh, we had the spherical camera that started Street View for Google and 360 for MapQuest. And uh, if you watch Hockey Night in Canada, you can watch it on the web with our spherical camera. Uh, if you were watching the X Games at Aspen a couple of weeks ago, we, we were filming that for Red Bull. Uh, I say we, I'm no longer part of the company, no longer own shares in the company. Uh, and that company, frankly, was a success in creating a product that everyone uses, uh, was a financial success, I think, for the early stage investors. Later, because of a disagreement among the board, uh, was less of a financial success for later investors. Uh, but, you know, and there were, there were lessons in that now. The company, uh, the public sh uh, company that we had has now been focusing on alternative energy. Rather than the camera, we privatized the camera company, and the camera company is doing, doing the things that uh, I just mentioned. Uh, I've done a few other things along the way. Uh, uh, Venture at Astra also has done a lot in geospatial imaging. We've got uh, a technology <coughs> that uh, Jeff Rhodes invented that uh, ultimately will help our spy satellites uh, take much, much better pictures. Uh, another technology that basically turns any wireless network or collection of wireless nodes into a loca location type system like GPS, uh, which has got some very exciting applications and people are still working that with various public and private uh, customers. Uh, and uh, I found myself to have the capability to invest in other entrepreneurs, sometimes at, at the twenty-five dollars to $50,000 level, some of which have done well, some of which uh, are still, you know, alive uh, and ha have potential. Uh, one of the exciting ones is that a, uh, that college roommate who actually had convinced me to go to business school uh, succeeded his father as head of the, uh, a company called Ellicott, which is one of the oldest dredge manufacturing firms in the United States. So a dredge manufacturing firm in Baltimore um, ended up going bankrupt because they had bet the company, they hadn't realized they were betting the company, on a big sale of dredges to Thailand. Thailand had changed governments and defaulted on the dredges, saying, well, that minister was dumb. He shouldn't have ordered them. We're not going to pay for them. And so we were caught holding the bag or that company was. I ended up being a trustee for the owners of the factory, so forth, and worked through the bankruptcy thing. We reorganized the company, got some venture capital invested in the company, and recently sold uh, a majority interest in the firm for a significant amount of uh, money to a major insurance company in, in Virginia called Markel. So what's interesting is here is a kid in Alaska living on the frontier, having the frontier thinking that, you know, first off, in Alaska, we are in the world and of the world. Don't ever think you are in a backwater in Anchorage, Alaska. You're not, okay? The second thing that I think is very important, and I had a, gr a couple of great mentors in business. Uh, one of them was George Kosmetsky, who as I would go through some of these things and say, well, you know, the guys, uh, George was helping me try to buy control of Digimark at the second time we needed money, and, and uh, um, my friend Jeff said, no, I think you're probably going to move it to Alaska. And, and uh, George consoled me and said, it doesn't matter what title you have as long as it's owner. Figure out how to be an owner, help, help, help make it work, whether you're on the inside or the outside, just to make that work. Governor Hickel's advice, uh, always, and it's actually carved on his tombstone down there by the Sheraton Hotel, if you go look at it, is stay free. Whatever you do, stay free. There's lots of things in business where you may think you're going to zig and the market zags. And stay free in your thinking. Make sure that you can change when the markets change. Uh, stay free in your thinking of don't let anybody own you. If you don't owe money, you can't go broke. So always be very, very careful with debt. It doesn't mean don't, let, don't use leverage, don't use debt. But you know, stay free in that regard. Uh, another one of his arguments is there's no wealth without production. And Several times, because he, he, he and I were co-partners in, in, in a couple of different ventures in digital marketing.